I have mass at 6.30 in Philadelphia. <laughs> so, um, so don't mind if I... You, you already hopefully read the Epistle and Gospel. Pray on that. Meditate on that during Mass. I'm going to... Because of time, I have to... I have to omit that. But, but, but you already followed it in the Mass. Also pray for... Uh, um, Father... Father Pfeiffer has been in Asia, and um, he saw Father Chazal, and Father Valen has joined with the priests to uh, help with the resistance. And uh, numerous chapels are starting in, in Asia and the Philippines. Father Pfeiffer has also been called by the faithful to go down to Australia, so he'll be going down there. And he'll be coming back to the United States in mid-May. Um, some people uh, seem upset because uh, they think that we're going into the parishes and establishing mass centers on our own without uh, to cause division. But in fact, the truth is the people are, are calling us to come. And they're calling the priests of the resistance to come everywhere. Uh, not just the United States, all over the world. And this because they see, they see the great danger to the faith. To the faith. And uh, fooled once, you don't want to be fooled twice. Vatican I swept a lot of priests, bishops, nuns, and laity on the road to hell and to lose their faith. And... Uh, it's understandable. You don't want this to happen again. We don't. I don't. And uh, you, we know from Archbishop Lefebvre, he tried to deal with these, these snakes of Rome. He tried to deal with these modernists, and he said, you don't shake hands with them. They are not honest men, and until they come back to Catholic tradition, you cannot uh, make any deals with them. No agreements, nothing. Just pray for their conversion. So keep praying. Bishop Bishop Tissier is in Ridgefield today, and I think he'll be in New Jersey today, right? Uh, so pray for him. Yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah. Yes, okay. Pray for him too. Uh, you know, he sees clearly. He has a good mind. He has an excellent book on the biography of Archbishop of Feb, which all of you should read. It's excellent. Um, I did write him respectfully to to just ask him, Your Excellency, do you think you're justified by remaining silent, by being obedient and saying nothing, as he's doing in Chicago? Can you justify that when you're one of the only very few bishops in the world left that has the faith? And I don't, I don't, I don't think it can be justified in God's eyes, but that's... That's for him to decide. Also, please um, pray for Bishop Williamson. You saw him recently. Was it a week ago? Two weeks ago? And uh, you see <laughs> the old battleship is scarred and been bombed at and uh, torpedoed, and he still keeps going. So thank God we have in this world that has gone with the lie of St. St. Paul. Uh, that's one of God's greatest punishments, is that the human race and many of the leaders will be swept, given to the lie, as St. Paul said. They will believe in the lie and in fables and all the uh, nonsense of human dignity and the rights of man over the rights of God and uh, the false religious liberty and all the errors of the modern world that all the previous popes condemned. Thank God we have a bishop who actually says the truth and has taken a lot of heat for it. So do pray for him and, uh, and pray for all the priests. Pray for all the priests. This is such a sad crisis in our society history. It's very, very grave. And um, it's so grave, not because of canonical questions, not because of arguing over two or three bishops or arguing over uh, you know, what color the vestments are really supposed to be. 
the big thing now is, is the faith. The faith is at stake. As Bishop Fillet himself warned Campos, the priests of Campos and Bishop Rifan, don't go towards Rome. Don't make a deal with them. The faith is at stake. If you make an agreement with them, it will be your destruction. And now, so keep praying. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's just the announcements. Now for the, the brief sermon. Very briefly, I'd like to uh, remind you of, um, of a few things. Because there's numerous schools of thought that are developing. One of them is saying that the only reason Archbishop Lefebvre did not go through with the agreement of 1988, signing the protocol, he signed it, and he really regretted it after. And um, some of, there is a school of thought saying that he, he really was happy with that signing of the protocol, that the only reason that he, he went ahead with the consecrations was the question of date and who would be a bishop. But I want to remind you that it's, it's much more profound than that. And if you follow and just read the Archbishop, you always see what is prominent in his mind is the faith, the salvation of souls and the keeping of the true Catholic faith and tradition. This is what Bishop, Tiss, Bishop uh, Tissi de Mallory in his book, Marcel Lefebvre, says about that, that day of uh, May 5th, 1988. The Archbishop prayed with his head in his hands throughout the rosary and benediction in the chapel, sometimes sighing. Then without saying anything, he retired to his room. He did not sleep that night. This was the, the night after... Uh, signing that protocol with five paragraphs. Later, he shared all this with his driver and confidant, Jacques Lagneau. The Archbishop said, If only you knew what a night I had passed after signing that infamous agreement. Infamous agreement. Oh, how I, would, how I wanted morning to come so that I could give Father Duchelard my letter of retraction which I had written during the night. So these are the bishops, Archbishop Lefebvre's own words. That, that I could give the letter of retraction which I had written during the night. The following day he finished off his letter and put it in an envelope which he showed Father Duchelard. Father, before leaving, he said, it is essential that this letter be taken to Cardinal Ratzinger. It's a little bomb. And then uh, Don Gerard, the abbot of La Baru Monastery, when he was interviewed by 30 Days magazine in 1995, he said, when I was asked why, when I asked why Archbishop Lefebvre had signed the agreement in the first place, the Archbishop said, that's what they, meaning the, the chief priests of the society, that's what they wanted. But then when I was by myself, alone, I realized that we could not trust it. And then Archbishop Lefebvre said in an interview in 1990, Our true believers, those who understand the problem, that is, those Catholics who realize the faith really here is at stake, they feared the steps that I took with Rome. They told me it was dangerous and that I was wasting my time. Yes, of course, I hoped until the last minute that Rome has to show a little bit of loyalty. One cannot blame me for not doing the maximum. So now to those who say to me, you must agree with Rome, I can safely say that I went even farther than I should have gone. I went farther than I should have gone. In other words, he, saw, he put his head in the lion's mouth and he pulled it out before... So, the Archbishop also um, said in his letter to the four bishops, it was the grace of God, the providence of God, the protection of God, that this agreement of May 5th did not come to anything. It came to naught, he said. 
It was a protection from heaven. Because had that agreement gone through, the SSPX priest would probably be saying the new Mass by now. Easily by now. It's 25 years since. The Archbishop also referred to this uh, in a talk he gave in St. Nicolas de Chardonnay, which is one of our big churches in Paris. He gave this about a week after. And he, and he was saying this. For them, this reconciliation means... He, firstly, the Archbishop explained the, the details of the, of the conversation with Cardinal Ratzinger, how he signed it, and how after signing it, he, he really felt uneasy. Um, <clears throat> after signing it, he also was received, he received a letter that was supposed to be submitted to the Pope. And this letter was supposed to ask the Pope forgiveness for all his errors. So the Archbishop knew that was a, it was all a trap. Again, he says, for them, this recon reconciliation, this agreement means, we shall give you this tradition for a little while, but after two or three years when you will have understood that you must accept the reforms, then your, com then your community masses will be the new mass. As for Dom Augustine, you may be allowed to say the traditional mass in private, but no more. Vatican II happened, you must accept Vatican II and its consequences. It is inadmissible that there be in the church people who do not accept the reforms and the consequences of Vatican II. And you see, when you look at all the groups that have made agreements with Rome, every one of them has been pressured to accept the council. Now, <clears throat> some, some of you youngsters who you don't remember living through this, you might ask, so what's the big deal about accepting the council or not? It's just a bunch of paper. It's just a bunch of documents. What's the danger to the faith? But you've got to understand, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, Vatican II was the triumph of the modernist ideas within the church. It was the greatest disaster to happen in the history of the church, said the Archbishop. And what happened was all the ideas that the popes have condemned for over 400 years, they all triumphed at Vatican II. And in other words, the smoke of Satan really entered the church and has everybody coughing and suffocating from the errors that proceeded from it. <clears throat> and it's very important to understand very simply what it all means. What does it all mean? Religious liberty means it's an attack on Christ the King. Christ said, I am the truth. There is no other truth. But Vatican II says, yes, there are other truths, and the state doesn't have to recognize the truth. So tear off the Catholic constitutions, tear down the Catholic countries, and let all the religions have their right to exist in the name of the rights of man. And this is a direct attack against Jesus Christ as king. It's a very serious sin. It's called by Leo XIII and Pius X um, state atheism. It's instituted apostasy. And that's what we have in the modern world, thanks to the uh, Vatican Council. And the, the bishops and even the Pope pushed these, like, these, these <coughs> horrible ideas, which are very practical. Because what does liber religious liberty mean in practice? Abortion laws, divorce laws, perverted civil marriage laws, secular education, and the rights for every filth, every disgusting thing, every right to exist. It's very serious. It tears down society, it tears down the family, it tears down what's left of anything sane. <coughs> Ecumenism. Ecumenism is a direct attack against Jesus Christ, the, the way. I am the way, he said. I am the door. There's no other door to heaven. There's no other carpenter that is built, like Noah, a huge ark out by which we can be saved, which is his Catholic Church, by the wood of his cross. There's no other way to heaven. 
And anyone that goes to heaven is always through Jesus Christ the King, through Him, and through His Catholic Church. There's no other way. And to say so is a lie. To say so is a rejection of the truth. And in the Vatican II documents, Lumen Gentium, and on the one on the church, it says that the Catholic Church is not really the true church. It's just the, the true church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, which is a direct attack against Christ, the only way to heaven. And it gives, it gives a equality to other false religions, that the Holy Ghost works through these false religions. And that's not true. That is an absolute heresy contained in the Vatican Council text. Condemned by the Church always. Mortale manimos, pascendi, syllabus of errors. So, and then uh, <clears throat> the, the, the document on the Constitution of the Church attacks the very infallibility of the Pope with the collegiality. And the Pope doesn't have a right to, to say, I'm just, a, I'm just a, a, a bishop among the bishops. He doesn't have the right to say that. And that's why the last one to, to wear the triple crown of the papacy was John the 23rd. That's the last one. And Pope Paul VI gave it away to the Jews on, in Wall Street. Because it's no longer the idea of the monarch, the infallible Pope. And with this Pope Francis, <clears throat> you can see he's pushing dem democracy like crazy. Just call me Jorge. And, uh, and all, uh, he doesn't genuflect at his Mass before the Holy Eucharist. We can question, does he even have the faith in the sacrifice of the Mass and in the Holy Eucharist? Doesn't seem to. I don't have bad knees, and I don't think he does either. And if I don't genuflect at the consecration, you have every right after Mass to corner me and say, Father, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you genuflect? Or do you still not believe in the Holy Eucharist? You have every right to ask that, because that's part of adoration to God. And it's, it's required in the Mass to show that. So, Jesus, you have to understand, the Vatican II is not just a bunch of books and documents that oh, we're all upset about. Understand, it's a direct attack against the true God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King, the Eternal High Priest, the only way to Heaven. That's why it's so serious. That's why we have to fight. Because if we lose the faith, and you will, you will, I will, if we dance with the modernists, we shake hands with them, and start stepping in that quicksand with the modernists, we will lose it. You don't dance with the devil. Eve, dialogue with the devil, look what happened. And Archbishop of Fayette, you know, how often he said this in his sermons. How often. You don't dialogue with the enemies of Jesus Christ. You pray for them, and the only reason, as he said, that I would go back to Rome was to try, in any way, to try to bring Rome back to its senses, to come back to Catholic tradition, and not to make some phony agreement where we can have our own rights and our recognition within the conciliar pantheon of all religions. No way. Listen to Archbishop's own words. This is, this is by his actions, by Archbishop Lefebvre's actions, he rejected this protocol and the agreement with Rome. And he said, thank God. But listen to this. People ask me, and why, Archbishop, have you stopped these discussions with Rome, which seem to have had a certain degree of success? It almost happened. Well, precisely, because at the same time that I gave my signature to the protocol, the envoy of Cardinal Ratzinger gave me a note in which I was asked to beg pardon for my errors. But if I am in error, if I teach error, it is clear that I must be brought back to the truth in the minds of those who sent me this note to sign. That I might recognize my errors means that if you recognize your errors, we will help you return to the truth. Now listen what he says. So what is this truth for them, if not the truth of Vatican II, and the truth of the conciliar church? Consequently, it is clear that the only truth that exists today for the Vatican is the conciliar truth, 
the spirit of the council and the spirit of Assisi. That is the truth of today. But we will have nothing to do with this for anything in the world. That is why, taking into account the strong will of the present Roman authorities to reduce tradition to nothing, to gather the world to the spirit of Vatican II and the spirit of Assisi, we have continued to withdraw ourselves and to say that we could not continue. It was not possible. And Archbishop Lefebvre, this is why uh, after the consecrations, he was very relieved. He was very much at peace. And all those years of struggling with the modernists, trying to save Catholic tradition, he saw there's no dealing with them. As he told Cardinal Ratzinger, you seek to de-Christianize society and the church, and we seek to put the crown on Christ the King. We seek to Christianize, to, to bring back Christ's kingship. And he says there, we are in diametrically opposed positions. So what do you do? When the Pope who's supposed to give us the faith doesn't give us the faith and, and is in fact promoting everything to destroy it. And do you think things are better today with Pope Francis? Does he have the traditional Catholic faith? Does he hold it high? He just told the Lutheran minister, we will celebrate, they're going to celebrate the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, the head of the Catholic Church. And the United Nations praised him as a <coughs> great man of peace. Woe to you, says our Lord, when the world, especially the United Nations, praises you. These men who are given to tear out everything of Christ, because they're Freemasons, that's their, that's their purpose. So, we are in a, in a war. It's a war. And the Archbishop understood this. It's a war for the faith. And not just having some canonical recognition. And you see the Archbishop's great love for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is like you know an immense building, but it's on fire. And he's trying to alarm the Pope and everybody. Wake up, the, the church is on fire. Wake up. They wouldn't wake up. So he said, all right, I have to continue what I can to save the faith until Rome comes back to tradition. And this he made very clear. And this, I remind you, the Virgin Mary foretold in Quito, Archbishop Lefebvre, that he would save the priesthood, save the Mass. He has the grace as founder of the Society of St. Pius X. He had a special grace from heaven. And he, and he laid down all the directives that we need to follow in this crisis. He wasn't infallible, as we saw. He tittered and tottered. He wavered a little bit with this protocol. But afterwards, he said no more. And th these are his words. Listen carefully. Because had the leaders of our dear society, St. Pius X, followed this, we would not be in the, the crazy mess that the society now is in where the faithful themselves are, are seeing it and wanting nothing to do with it. And all over the, the world we hear this. We're no longer going to the society masses. And you know what? In a certain way, if, if they understand that by going there, they're participating in this, this acceptance of the new protocol of 2012 and that whole movement towards Rome, then they're right. They're right. Because look at history. The Pax priests in Hungary who were communists and made a pact with the communists, guess what kind of mass they said? The traditional Latin mass. But the people said, we're not going. Because they have sided with the enemies of God. And just think, all those bishops of Vatican II who applauded, applauded the revolution within the church, including Father Ratzinger, when he was there with his suit and tie at, at the Vatican Council, <laughs> with, with Yves Congar and all these crooks in their suit and tie as priests. 
guess what kind of mass they were saying? They were saying the traditional Latin mass. And, uh, you know, all in history, the Arians, the Arian heretics and all, they all said this mass. So when the faith is in danger, uh, you, you, you sometimes, like we tell, we've told people all the time, you can't go to the Indo Mass and St. Peter's Mass. You can't. Why? Because it puts your soul in danger, your faith. Because it's part of the conciliar, the conciliar Hegelian dialectic thinking. The conservatives and the liberals work together to balance out the Catholic Church. That's not true. We're not conservative Catholics. We're Catholic. Period. Archbishop Lefebvre. This is uh, in an interview in 1988 in December. Listen carefully because it really shows the battle plan. Here it is. Very simple. Had Bishop Fillet followed this, things would be much different and much better. We do not have the same outlook on a reconciliation. Cardinal Ratzinger sees it as reducing us, bringing us back to Vatican II. So you see, it wasn't just as the new trend of thought is saying out of the higher echelons of the Society of St. Pius X and being taught in our seminary that the only reason the Archbishop didn't go through with the agreement was just a question of the Bishop. No, it's not that. It's much deeper, and he says it very often. The reason was they want to bring us back to Vatican II. They want us to accept the Council, to accept the new Mass. We see it as a return of Rome to tradition. We don't agree. It is a dialogue of death. I can't speak much of the future. Mine is behind me. But if, if I live a little while, supposing that Rome calls for a renewed dialogue, and you know how often Rome wants to knock at the door of the SSPX, then I will put conditions... And believe me, they are not like the six traitorous conditions of last July. They are not at all like that. I shall not accept being in the position where I was put during the dialogue no more. So here's what he says. I will place the discussion at the doctrinal level. So you see, no longer, we're, gonna, we're not going to worry about being, being uh, exonerated or... Uh, justice being done. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about is the Catholic faith of the Roman Catholic Church. I will put it at the doctrinal level, and I will ask the Pope, do you agree with the great encyclicals of all the Popes who preceded you? Do you agree with Quanti Cura of Pius IX, Immortali Dei and Libertas of Leo XIII, Pascendi Gregis of Pius X, and he goes through the whole list of the great encyclicals of the great popes. Do you still uh, accept the entire anti-modernist oath? Are you in favor of the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, that one. That hits their raw nerve. They hate that one. Because they all believe in democracy and kingship of Christ and uh, the laws of God and the Catholic faith alone being protected by the law. Just the liberals can't stand that. So... If you do not accept the doctrine of your predecessors, it is useless to talk. Archbishop Lefebvre, it is useless to talk. As long as you do not accept the correction of the council in consideration of the doctrine of these popes, your predecessors, no dialogue is possible, it is useless. Thus the positions will be clear. So the Archbishop understood and we should have learned from him the, uh, the wisdom of having battled with the modernists. You don't dialogue with them. And, uh, and so this is after the consecrations, after years of battling with them. He laid down the line, this is the directive. No agreement. No discussion until Rome professes the faith of all time. It's that simple. But now what has happened is we have the preamble signed last year, April 15th, which became only public in the last two months, with some very serious, serious compromises. 
and I can dare say the doctrinal preamble with its ten paragraphs is really a masterpiece of modernism because if you're not careful you can look read it and say well it seems okay seems traditional but a modernist in Rome will say it and say oh they do accept the new mass now as legitimate oh they do accept the count the new code of canon law oh they do see that Vatican II does enlighten and deepen the doctrine of the church dangerous and uh, even present within itself a doctrine not yet conceptually formulated. What is this? Not yet formulated? Doctrine of the church not yet formulated? As if the Holy Ghost hasn't done his job with the revelation and tradition? And since when do we use modernist terms in traditional language? And believe me, I know better. All the priests of the society know better. Bishop Fillet knows better not to use the language of the modernists. Living transmission of revelation? What's that? A modernist, oh, they love that. Living transmission? That means, that means revelation is still going on from your interior depths of your consciousness. That's modernism. Tradition progresses in the church. They're, they're very dangerous phrasing right there, with no distinction. And then open to discussion, dialogue on religious liberty, on uh, the non-Catholic Christian confessions. Open to dialogue. You don't dialogue with what the church has condemned. So you see, uh, notice also that in the old 1988 preamble, which the Archbishop basically, in his actions, certainly refuted. But notice it said, it did not say the legitimate new mass, but the new one puts it in. The, 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 recognizes the, the legitimacy of the promulgation of the new mass. So if you recognize the legitimacy of the new mass, that's one step from saying it. And that's why La Baru, when they made the agreement with Rome in 1988, Archbishop of Saint Philip Lefebvre said they'll be saying the new Mass in five years. And he was a prophet. In five years they had the new Mass. Why? Because Abbot, Abbot Gerard, he was, in, he was opening his doors to novice Odo priests to come in. And while they were visiting the monastery, they were allowed to say the new Mass on their side chapels. So he already had cohabitation. And another big warning to you, a warning, because this is a new trend of thought within the Society of St. Pius X, where they totally say that Sumorum Pontificum is okay. And they accept it. And they're surprised, some of the priests and seminarians, they're surprised that we dare to actually accuse it as a bad document. And it is. Why is it? Firstly, the Trinity Mass was never abrogated. And that's all it says in that document. It just says the truth. It never was abrogated. But we all knew that. But then it goes on to say that the, the normal Mass, the normal rite, the, the ordinary rite of the Catholic Church is the new Mass. The new Mass that attacks Christ's divinity, Christ's sacrifice, Christ's real presence, the priesthood and that's the ordinary and we're praising this document and it puts the Trinity and Latin Mass the true Mass of all grace the true sacrifice on the shelf in the cupboard the extraordinary form and it's considered equal with the new Mass you don't put Christ with Belial you don't put Christ with Barabbas you don't put truth with error and light with darkness but that is now the new thinking and it's very dangerous and it's in the minds of the priests and the seminarians that Sumorum Pontificum is basically a good document and that is false it's unacceptable and then the, the, the question of the excommunications remember there's a difference between lifting an ex excommunication that's, lifting means there really was one 
But <clears throat> repealing means Rome made a mistake. And it's not a real excommunication. So I know it's a little touchy on distinction of words, but but uh, we should not have accepted the lifting of this so-called of the excommunications that never existed. And that's the words Rome used. They were supposed to use repeal because it was an unjust sentence. And uh, well, we should be. That's, that doesn't mean things are better in the church now. I ask you, are things better in the church now? Are things more traditional? But look at the websites of, of ssbx.org, look at dici.org, you will not find one criticism of this modernist pope. Not one yet. Not one yet. And he's done enough damage already. He is the pope, we've got to pray for him, but you're not going to convert the church from switching from boxing gloves to nail polish. Since when do the SXPX priests take off their battling boots for war and put on ballerina slippers? And that's what's happening. And since when do we uh, no longer preach against the open modernism of the churchmen as we always have and we must do to warn the faithful, to warn the world of the danger to the faith. And since when do we start using duct tape on our, on our own priests? And that is why, dear faithful, <clears throat> that is why I had to pay the 30 pieces of silver. And I could be happily trotting along in my parish in Chicago. I would be living with Bishop, Philip, Bishop Tissier and Father Ward, and uh, normally I would love to be there. I would love to be there doing circuits and being with Bishop Tissier. But the price I had to pay was, you be silent <clears throat> on the matter of the agreement. You're not allowed to say anything on it in the future. And some say, well, that's just a prudential question, so why don't you obey? But, okay, it's a prudence question, but this prudence also hinges on the matters of the faith. Because if we're silent when the wolves are allowed to attack the sheep, what kind of shepherds are we? So I made the, all of us priests made the anti-modernist oath. And by that, we, it means we have to bark out against what is dangerous to the faith. And this agreement and this whole movement towards the agreement, including the general chapter statement, the six conditions and the, the new uh, pro, uh, doctrinal preamble are a, a very serious compromise. And I love the Society of Pius X, and because I love the Society and all its bishops and priests, we have to speak out that this is wrong. And we, you've got to pray that there'll be a about face. But you heard Bishop Williamson, it's, it seems thinner and thinner possibilities. Let me just close with Archbishop Lefebvre's great words. It is striking to see how our fight now is exactly the same fight as was being fought then by the great Catholics of the 19th century in the wake of the French Revolution. And by the popes, Pius VI, Pius VII, Pius VIII, 8th, Gregory the 16th, Pius the 9th, Leo the 13th, and so on, Pius the 10th, down to Pius the 12th. Their fight is summed up in the encyclical Quanta Cura, with the syllabus of Pius the 9th, and Pascendi of Pius the 10th. These are the two great documents, sensational and shocking in their day, laying out the Church's teaching in the face of the modern errors. The errors appearing in the, de the course of the Revolution, especially in the Declaration of the Rights of Man. This is the fight we are in the middle of today, exactly the same fight. Well, we must not be under any illusions. We find ourselves in the same situation. We are fighting a fight guaranteed by a whole line of popes. Hence, we should have no hesitation or fear, such as, why should we be going on our own? After all, why not join Rome? Why not join the Pope? Yes, 
if Rome and the Pope were in line with tradition, this is always the condition. And it's been forgotten by our society leaders. And this is so sad because that's why the mess. If Rome and the Pope were in line with tradition, if they were carrying on the works of all the popes of the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, of course, we'll make an agreement. No problem. But they themselves admit that they have set out on a new path. They themselves admit that a new era began with Vatican II. They admit that it is a new stage on the Church's life, wholly new, based on new principles. We need not argue the point. They say it themselves. It is clear. I think we must drive this point home with our people in such a way that they realize their oneness with the Church's whole history. You're fighting the fight of the great Catholics of the Vendée. You're fighting the fight of the great Catholics of the... In the, 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 the the Falahe, the, the great warriors uh, in Spain who resisted the revolution. You're fighting the fight of our fathers in Ireland who defended the faith of all time and died for it. You're fighting the fight of the Cristeros in Mexico who fight it, the same Jesus Christ, the same King, the same Mass. And you're fighting the fight of all the saints. So it's important we see this. Of course, it is the fight of the city of Satan against the city of God. It's clearly. So we do not have to worry. We must, after all, trust in the grace of God. And then he says, what's going to happen? We don't know. That's a mystery in God's hands. But we do know this. You don't shake hands with the modernists. And our, our dear Superior General was warned. And... Uh, I don't know what he's going to do but pray for him but in the meantime hold fast keep strong in the faith and stand strong on the great principles of the faith and uh, let's turn to the mother of God she is always the, the bulwark the defense of her divine son she is an enemy to Vatican II the Virgin Mary is an enemy of Vatican II because Vatican II attacks her son. She's an enemy of ecumenism. She's an enemy of religious liberty. She's an enemy of the stripping of the papacy, of the infallible authority of the monarchy. Collegiality does that. She's an enemy to the new code of canon law. She's an enemy to the new mass, which makes a mockery of her son and attacks his real presence in sacrificial mass. She's an enemy to the... to... Uh, this whole spirit of trying to interpret Vatican II in the light of tradition. It's not going to work. The only thing you can do with Vatican II, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, the whole thing is deeply perverse. It is poison through and through. It is based on the modernist subjectivist philosophy. It's poison. The only way to handle it is a, a Someday in the future, a pope will condemn it officially and resurrect the great, great teachings of the, of the popes with the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which we pray will come soon than, sooner than later. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us. In the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.